Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to A View from the Centre. I'm Peter Tood, Chief Investment Officer of the Embark Group. Today, as topics are macroeconomic perspectives, asset markets, uh, preferences within those asset markets, and then just a quick update on um, things we're picking up um, in, in the um, ESG debate that is, uh, as we know, very much ongoing. The macroeconomic perspectives. We have a central case, we have alternative scenarios uh, pictured here. They haven't really changed that much from, from the last time we presented these to you. I would say the big change probably is that we've seen the effect of the vaccines in terms of their success in the developed world, particularly the developed Western world, and the reopening um, of economies and the implications that's had for um, asset preferences. I think it's fair to say that we still expect the governments and central banks to continue to respond aggressively to what has been a very serious supply side shock. Um, this is a, 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 the kind of shock last seen in the uh, early 70s during the oil crisis when the oil, oil price quadrupled, petrol pump prices um, responding accordingly. In those times, we, the Americans, uh, boosted aggregate demand. Our response to a supply side shock was to boost aggregate demand, just as we have done this time. Other parts of the world, particularly Asia, have been less aggressive in terms of their approach to this and their easing, perhaps because they obviously didn't have quite such the scale of crisis that we had. So we've got two different versions of the world currently, very heavy stimulus from certain parts of the world, not so aggressive elsewhere. Europe sits somewhere in between those two. The same alternative scenarios still apply. There is a, a continuation of really what we've had through most of uh, 2008 to now, really since the global financial crisis, defined as secular stagnation. Um, there is stimulus, there is fiscal and monetary stimulus, but it actually doesn't have the kind of impact that the politicians are looking for, which are specifically politicians and central bankers, which is to keep inflation at or above 2%. So in other words, disinf disinflationary forces remain. Um, we look a lot like the previous decade, um, and sadly, that also means inequality will extend further. Um, the alternative scenario is that actually the boost to aggregate demand, as outlined in the central case, results in um, an inflationary boom. Uh, the big government is definitely back. Money supply remains plentiful. We actually create a boom. Um, those are two alternatives. You have to wait, uh, put the weight on in favour of the central case, but we're aware and alive to the alternatives. And that's what we're hearing when talking to fund managers. Um, in terms of asset markets, again, a lot of this work comes off our work in terms of um, talking to yeah, the specialists in their sectors. As matters of fact, government bond yields are indeed still very low in nominal terms. 10-year guilt is yielding 70 basis points, 0.7 in old money. That means it's deeply negative in terms of real inflation-adjusted returns. You know, you're losing money by owning that 10-year guilt at the moment if you buy one today. Um, bond managers are relatively uninspired at the moment by the opportunities they see. You can't get excited when your bond yields are so low. You can't get particularly excited when the spread, the difference between owning an investment grade and a high yield bond and a government bond in terms of your percentage is also relatively low. Um, high yield funds are yielding four to five percent. That's that's quite exceptional. Investment grade bond funds at two, two and a bit. So um, relatively moribund um, asset, one would argue. Equities, very clearly, um, it's been a good six months for equities. It's been a boon for value orientated strategies. However, in recent weeks, you've seen growth funds um, reassert themselves, they've staged a bit of a renaissance. Developed world markets very clearly have been more resilient. They've had a more successful vaccine programs alluded to earlier, um, and they've done better than emerging markets in terms of pure performance. But it's fair to say the rocky road to recovery is still a rocky road. Um, you still need to be balanced approach, and you still need to be prudent when you're thinking about your geography and your style positioning. Um, aggressive positions at this point are not warranted in truth. Um, Underneath those two core assets, what are we saying? Um, managers, particularly bond managers, looking at this with a sort of not quite shrug of the shoulders, but more of a not a lot to go for here. If you look at the performances of, say, core UK corporate bond funds, there's a great deal of similarity in the returns year to date. 
a very little differentiation is possible at this point, given given what's going on, which is basically central bankers buying and or supporting uh, bond markets. Uh, the old line is if bond markets crash, you have a depression. If equity markets crash, you have a recession. And the, and, uh, the central banks are making sure they're very level best to make sure the bond markets do not actually crash. Interest rate sensitivity, duration by another name. What a manager is doing about duration, not a great deal. I think they're very, very aware of the central bank's focus on controlling the yield curve. They don't want to bet against that by being aggressively short duration. In other words, not having any interest rate sensitivity in the portfolio, even though yields are so low, um, they're, they're not being too aggressive um, because they're aware in the background of big beast busy buying up the bonds. So uh, very aware of the fact there's an element of control in these mar in these um, in, in these bond markets. So that means that yield hungry investors, I'm afraid, still have to go out on the high yield spectrum. But you know, you're buying high yield credit. High yield credit is more risky. But the comment that comes back from managers on a continuous basis is there's no obvious default cycle or holding in interview at this point. No one is anticipating a deeply aggressive negative cycle, particularly with such a supportive fiscal and monetary position. Um, that you're seeing from the central banks. And value is winning in the equity space, so to the right-hand side. Value strategies have staged a dramatic recovery, mostly or initially on the back of the vaccine programme, obviously then a degree of ebullience around the election of President Biden um, in, in the US. Uh, that was the next leg of the belief that there will be more stimulus, more monetary stimulus um, given by the Democrats and the Republicans. Value orientated strategies have literally travelled very far this year, though. I mean, uh, even some of the value managers are questioning the speed of this uh, repricing of, of their stocks. And uh, we think from our perspective, we're certainly picking up the sense that uh, growth funds have a fighting chance to regain the upper hand, um, perhaps in the second half of the year. They own many of the digital disruptors. They're not in some of the special situations companies, which is where all the value trades were really six months ago. And an inherent belief that the digitization of the world and the platform world we operate in is one that naturally favors the growth style. Where that comes on start, by the way, is if we have a significant inflation bout, something we'll talk about in a second. Um, but as we stand today, we don't know the inflation trends. What we do know is at the moment they're exaggerated in the US, you're printing numbers of you know, four or five percent, they're big numbers. Um, there is a belief that they're transitory given the supply constraint. But um, there could be tighter monetary policy down the road, even though that's just defined as not buying as many bonds as today, this elusive tapering as it's known. Whatever the scenario, everyone is watching it and expect just more volatility on the back of that. Certainly all the managers we're talking to are alive to that possibility and that's something they're all focusing on. Finally, ESG, a very hot topic as we all know at the moment. It's, it's occupying a lot of the pages in the press. To remind ourselves, the um, regulations for the offshore fund ranges, uh, those operating in the uh, continental European uh, regime, now have had to actually flag themselves under the SFTR regulations. My mind are again, Article 6 ESG integrated. Article 8 is a combination of uh, integration and uh, positive impact. And then the final one is Article 9, where the entire mandate is geared towards positive impact investing. All funds have had to put themselves into those bandings um, as we stand today. That exercise has been done in offshore land. From our perspective, we obviously don't have those regulations in place yet in the UK. They are on the to do list for the FCA this year. Uh, we think they may look quite common with the SFDR regulations, but we, we have to wait and see. What we're focusing on is the implications of the funds in our buy list on any changes resulting from that deeper integration of ESG processes, often and often on shore fund we run together. So we're very finely focused on um, what it implies for um, the process we have understood for many, many years in many cases. Does it meaningfully change uh, what they, their approach? And by the way, most of the time it does not at this point, I have to say. Uh, we continue to see from the management meetings we're having on this topic, every fund meeting involves a conversation around ESG today. Um, there's managers who are definitely in favour of engagement, and I would say the vast bulk of the people we're talking to are in favour of engagement. And there are those that are working um, either favour or work within exclusions. So there's going to be a, a, an absolutely um, 
a dividing line between these two through time. And that's the last point on positive impact funds. Um, they are highly stylized. They've got a very different mandate. Uh, they mustn't be confused with the ESG integrated funds, of which almost the bulk of the rest of the investing universe is. And I know there's a degree of confusion out there today. Um, beware of the ESG badge or even the sustainability badge applied to what is, after all, probably a fairly mainstream vehicle at this point. Positive impact is very, very clear. The mandate's very clear. The mandate itself has to state that as the primary objective. All other funds, that's not the case. Finally, just finishing off with what we do. Remind you, there's a fund and investment research um, part of what we do, um, which is our heritage is in fund selection. It's a free to on free uh, service. You could just have to register. We have a panel of funds which you can populate your portfolios with. We have additional materials, which is bulletins around those funds, overviews of the entire sector. We take on board what's going on in the sector. We put the context of the funds we recommend within that. A monthly viewpoint where we summarise what's going on both in asset markets. Um, and in terms of uh, what we have done with our panel and buy lists, guidance pieces, sometimes we pick up on topics that, that are interesting and, and then we'll also obviously add articles in uh, where we deem them relevant in, in the same vein. Finally, of course, consulting services, as and when you might need our help, please, please do ask us. Um, thank you for your time. I hope it's been useful and see you again soon. Thank you.